Welcome to the Old Soul, New Soul Astrology Podcast. Thomas Miller here along with Robert Glasscock. We're going to wrap up this Secrets series and the subsequent questions that we've just answered in the last two episodes with a walk through the 12 houses. Now, we're not going to necessarily focus it exclusively on the secrets, but we are going to at least give you some of the high points that in Robert's cookbook, (laughs) the houses would uh, at least signify. So if you needed to come up with that quickest answer on what is the sixth house all about, well, we're going to do it now. So this is going to be fast. It's not going to be comprehensive. And Robert, actually, this came from a question from Julie, one of our very loyal listeners and members of our Discord, that she asked, and I answered it just on the side without bringing it here because... I referred her, she wanted to know a good book on the houses. And of course, I referred her to Mark Edmund Jones' book on horrorary. She was able to find a copy and was could grab it, so she now has that in her library. It's out of print. But so much of your housework, I know, is attributed to Mark Edmund Jones' brilliant work in that book. So let's just, we're, <laughs> again, we can't do, we can't be comprehensive, but let's at least start off with the first house and we'll spend a minute or two on each one and move on around the wheel. Well, you're absolutely right about Mark Edmund Jones' book on orary astrology. It's still, to me, the best um, and most thorough description of each house and, and its functionality and what it means as applied to orary astrology, but the two, uh, orary and natal astrology, go back and forth. And uh, the reason I recommended that book or have to so many students is that it really does clarify the houses and their interrelationships really better than anything else uh, that I've read. Not that there aren't contemporary writers uh, after him who do an equally good job, but it's certainly a good place to start. The first house then in orary, and you go back and forth. In orary astrology, the first house is the querent or the person asking the question, as most astrologers know, or it's the question or the, the issue that they're bringing to you. It, it, is, it describes the focus of everything. Same thing is true in your natal chart. The first house is you in this life. And it's the sign on the cusp and the decanate of that sign and the dwad of that sign are really the reasons you were born. These are why you were born. And they may not be as such obvious reasons. In my case, or anybody's really, with Capricorn rising, it, it suggests many things that, one, they're born to test their ambitions in this life. They may fail or they may succeed, but they're born to test their ambitions, whether or not they can actualize themselves physically. It's an earth sign. Tangibly, it's an earth sign. A lot of times that's associated with uh, uh, status, with Capricorn rising. So the sign rising is like the description of the costume you're wearing. If, you know, Shakespeare said we are mere players strutting our hour upon the stage. Uh, So you come into this life to play a role, and it may be the role of a victim. It may be the role of a a leader. Uh, It may be the role of a doctor. It may be the role of a mechanic, uh, and so on. So that's the first house. It's... uh, it's you, and it's your persona. It's the mask that you wear, the uh, the image that you project, and sometimes that's unconscious. I am not really aware of the kind of image I project. It's always surprising to me sometimes when people will say something to me, complimentary especially. I think that's interesting. They'll describe me and so on. So that's the first house. The second house is... Our self worth. It's you read in the books. It's the house of money. It's and it is. It's the house of money. It's the house of liquid assets as opposed to fixed assets like property, which is at the fourth house. Fixed assets are not easily converted to cash. You have to go through a process to sell them and so on, like property. The second house is liquid resources. They're things that you have that are convertible to cash. Among them, your talents. Talents is an ancient word for money, in fact, but the second house will show you by the sign on the cusp and the rulers of that sign and planets in that house, how you value yourself or what you value in yourself and therefore how you can make money 
and spend it. It's also described by the second house. So it's the house of your self-worth. And if the ruler of the second is in hard aspects with certain other planets, then you can have self-worth issues, which astrology helps to describe. But it's what you value. It's what you value in yourself and usually in in other people as well. Uh, the third house, that yes, it has to do with relatives and siblings, uh, but it really is the mind. It's your habitual routine way of thinking about life itself. So, yes, it has to do with brothers and sisters and blood relatives, but it also has to do with communications of any kind, uh, uh, emails, chats, uh, letters, uh, writing, books, and on and on and on. So, communication. And just your mental outlook on life. I have Pisces on the third house, and that is my mind. It's very Piscean. And I I have had to learn how to honor all of the facets of that Pisces third house mind. I have a lot of interest in life, but real interest, serious. Art, painting is one. Uh, That was really one of the first talents, I guess, that my parents even encouraged me. Five years old, I was taking art lessons and piano lessons. So music and, and, and piano, in my case, was another one. My dad, for example, put himself through college with his own band. So the third house that's the the mental perspective that you have on life and it's how you communicate how you talk how you use your hands how you use your body your body language it's fine motor coordination it's mental interests that you have things you love to talk about and so on and so forth the fourth house is really the house of security it's our own personal concept of the archetype of a home and family and security. I happen to have Aries on my fourth cusp. That describes a Martian sense of security, an Aries sense of security. I am at my most secure when I am starting something new, which I always am. Now, the problem with Aries, as we all know, is finishing completing things but i live very much in tomorrow because i have aries on that moving doesn't phase me i've moved so many times in my life only in my adulthood have i finally for the first and only time in my life lived at one address for 20 years never ever happened before that so the fourth cusp describes your sense of foundation and security and the thing i know about myself is that no matter what happens today, if it's horrible, tomorrow will be better. And I can make it tomorrow, make happen what I want to happen tomorrow. So I live that way. And that's just ingrained in me. And it's always been true for me. So that fourth house describes your home, your family. Aries is not necessarily a familial kind of sign because it's so individualistic and the the security of Aries on the fourth cusp, which is true for anybody with Capricorn rising, their security is in their own selves and they have to learn it over and over and over again. But they do as a rule. So the fifth house then becomes this house as you and I've talked about the projection of self into the future. And it also, the fifth house rules the things that give us pleasure It can be the arts, it can be sexual pleasure, it can be uh, uh, spiritual pleasure, ecstasy, spiritual ecstasy is ruled by this house. Uh, And it's an amazing feeling if you've ever had spiritual ecstasy, because it is truly ecstatic in in a way that nothing else is. Uh, And it's uh, a sense of feeling a part, uh, a loving part of everything. It can get big, big, big. This is why nuns and priests in in history have written about ecstasy, the kind of ecstasy that they have. This house rules creativity, the fifth house. So it's one of the keys to finding and following your bliss. The sign on the fifth house will tend to indicate hobbies, for example, that you love. 
uh, creative pastimes that you love to do. And the idea of figuring out a way to turn those loves and those talents, it's another house that rules talents, into a career is part of uh, one of the secrets to living a long time. Because if you really love what you're doing in life, you tend to be healthier and, and longer lived. And it rules other things that are more superficial. It rules jewelry and luxuries and amusements of all kinds and carnivals and the theater and all of those sorts of things. It rules sports of all kinds. And it rules learning. The fifth house very much is associated with education. Everybody thinks of the ninth house. The ninth house is much more specialized learning. So it has to do with what we call higher learning, which is when people go after higher degrees or specialize in certain sciences or certain subjects like astrology and so on. But learning itself is a fifth house experience. And in order astrology, it rules everything connected with learning, everything, the teachers, the subjects, everything. So it, the fifth house is a, a wonderful key to having a fulfilling life. The sixth house, this is the house of health and occupation in the old cookbooks. I call it the house of psychological self-integration because to me, in my experience, the sign on this cusp the sixth cusp and the planets in the sixth house really describe a person's psychology as a whole. Uh, I have Uranus in Gemini and retrograde in the sixth house. My nature is Uranian. That's how I put everything together in Uranian ways and through Gemini, through communications books. I've always been this way. And this also, that house of the sixth house is in conjunct with the ascendant, with the physical body. So the sixth and the eighth are both houses of adjustments, constant adjustments that affect both the mind and the body. So those two houses are in conjunct with the ascendant, and they're both associated with, house, with health, and in the eighth house, specifically associated with death as well when that comes so they're important houses but the sixth house very much will identify what you do how you perform day to day in your work and occupation i took typing in high school <laughs> because my girlfriend at the time was taking typing in high school and so i wanted to be with her and so we studied the capital business typing turns out to be the foundation of my entire life Ever since, this is all I have done. I've got great fingers. They're in great shape. I've, I can't tell you. For American astrology, I was publishing 225,000 words a year. So the sixth house describes what you do, how you perform, what your role is on the job, how you work, relate to your coworkers, for example. So that's the sixth house. And it does relate to health because if, if parts of you in our condition of dis-ease or lack of harmony – over time, that will produce physiological effects as well. So that's how that house happens to rule health, the seventh house. This is the other with a capital O. It's how it's really how we see the world outside of ourselves and what we're looking for in the world outside of ourselves. Very specifically, it's the qualities that we are looking for in a mate or a partner. And that can be an emotional partner, as in love and marriage, or it can be a business partner. Sometimes it's both, which is very difficult to do, but a lot of people do, and a lot of people try. But it's those one-on-one -on -one relationships and what we do and don't get from them. So studying your seventh house will tell you a lot about what you really want and are seeking in, in a partner, in a relationship. It's also in orary, for example, the seventh house shows you the direct cooperation or lack of that from other people and from the environment. So in orary, when you pick a, a house that rules the question, once you've determined that, then the house opposite it will show you the environment's reaction to the question for good or ill and the disposition of the two rulers, the ruler of the question or the ruler of the first house and the ruler of the seventh house will show you whether the outcome is likely to be favorable or not. In my case, I have Capricorn rising, Cancer on my seventh. I have Saturn, my ruler in Cancer, in my seventh and Saturn is in a grand cross in my chart. Love and marriage have not 
worked out to be the fairy tale that I thought they were supposed to be. But as it turns out, through their failures or the failures of my relationships to last until death do us part, turns out to be what I've always wanted and didn't realize and couldn't know as a, a younger man. And that is, I am a solitaire by nature, which is really true. I would never have known that or understood that about myself without astrology. But once I did, it made sense. I much prefer living at this age without a mate. Other people don't. And believe me, there are a lot of people who don't prefer that. So that's the seventh house, really, is direct cooperation or lack of it between you and the environment, especially those people most significant and closest to you, like a mate or like a business partnership. It also, this house shows direct competition, the seventh house. And this house is also the house that rules the fine arts. Anytime anybody raises a talent to the level of renown or extraordinary achievement, the fine arts, those things are shown by the seventh house as well. Saturn is exalted in Libra, and it's accidentally dignified when it's placed in the seventh house. So I have Saturn in a lousy sign for Saturn. It's in Cancer, but it's in the seventh house, and it's accidentally dignified. So the relationships I have had have been incredible and wonderful and heartbreaking at the end. It's been, they've been all of those. But boy, have I learned a ton of stuff from them. And do I love them still, you know, and love what I learned from them. So that's the seventh. The eighth house, oh, the word transformation, of course. It's an interesting word. Scorpio, the eighth house, Pluto, transformation. It means to fundamentally alter something the entire meaning of something so this house is associated with what we call death which is simultaneously a rebirth when we die it's the physical body that is dying the soul doesn't and i can read about this for millions of years and decades and documents, but once you experience it through an out-of-body thing, for example, oh, then suddenly you realize this is actually real. This is completely different from a dream. This is completely different from hallucinations or drug-induced anything. This is real. And once you've had those experiences, even one time, you realize, okay, they're telling the truth. Well, that is a transformation. When you go from being a physical individual to a non-physical so there's, it's a huge transformation. So this house has to do with that. Um, it also has a lot to do with sex because sex is transformative. When two people make love, their physical, emotional, spiritual, and intellectual bodies are all intertwined. And so you have biochemical, biological juices and secretions and electromagnetic fields that are blending and blending with some passion and intensity during sex. Sex changes both individuals every time you have it. That's part of its meaning. And the French have a word for orgasm. I love this phrase, le petit mort, the little death, which is the death of the ego at sexual climax. It transcends the ego. Suddenly you're at one with your partner in the universe for a moment. And it's transformative on every level, emotionally, intellectually, and so on. This is why promiscuity, it's not that it's a sin. It's that it's so darn confusing to the body, to the electromagnetic fields. You have three, four, five thousand partners in life. Then you've been changed by every one of them. And so where are you in that mix? What have you become? And so on. And the eighth house is also uh, the house of... Uh, estates and inheritances and so on but it's a tremendously psychic and spiritual house and people with strong eighth houses i have pluto in that house so i tend to be obsessed with spirituality and and pleasure as well when i was younger uh, but spirituality and metaphysics and transformation uh, in my own life have been major factors 
so that's the 8,000 in a nutshell, tremendously deep, the deepest. If you have compulsive behaviors, they're likely to be indicated by the 8,000 zone. The 9,000, this is the higher mind and, and all that it indicates, uh, knowledge, science, uh, values, customs, philosophy and religion, psychic ability, higher guides, metaphysics, uh, and then, of course, publishing and, and writing and communicating on a larger scale. Third house is routine communications. Anything that's lifted out of the routine, if you're doing a Zoom conference, if you're publishing a book or writing an article, that's that's ninth house because you're spreading some kind of idea or communication or message to a larger or group collective, a projection of yourself at a distance, for example. That's what the ninth house does. So it rules long trips. The ninth house also happens to rule fame, which is distinct from honor, which is shown in the, the tenth house. But fame is ruled by the ninth house. Ethics, your sense of ethics, ruled by the ninth house. So it's very much a philosophical and spiritual house. Now, it's spiritual and religion, and there's a difference. Spirituality transcends religion. There may be spirituality contained in religion, but religions are, in essence, tribal stories about God or religion. They're not the thing itself. They're stories about it, and they're all geared to keep the tribe going. So the ninth house is where we learn the difference between religion and spirituality, which is something, of course, that's going on worldwide today is is looking at that difference um this is also the ninth house in, in astrology and orary rules accidents liability to them and also natural disasters rule with the ninth house the tenth house is your ego for starters it's also the place of your social position to whatever extent you may have authority over yourself or over others shown at, at the tenth house it's also the house then of superiors and employers and governmental units that you are subservient to, maybe. It generally will show a level of ambition or a person's, the nature of a person's ambition, which, and some people don't, are not particularly ambitious. Some are. This house will show a distinctive profession compared to the sixth house, which is more of the the day-to-day -day functions that you perform to do your work. The tenth house is really um, levels of professionalism or levels of, of public recognition and so on, because those require discipline and time to achieve as a rule. So the eleventh house then becomes in the old cookbooks, hopes, dreams, and ambitions. It's our projection, our collective projection of ourself into the future. So in a way, if you think of the fifth house as the projection of yourself into the future, the eleventh house opposite is the projection of you collectively into the future, often the projection of yourself in connection with a mate or business partner, because the eleventh is the fifth house from the seventh house. So the 11th house is the future projection of all partnerships in your life into the future. So you can look and see how they turn out as a rule. And if they look like they don't turn out well in your life, then you can study why not and get a lot of clues from your own behaviors, your own beliefs, and your own choices in how you behave and what you choose will tell you why they don't work out. Also, why they do work out. So the 11th house really is our projection of, of ourselves into the collective future. So it's how we relate to friends and groups of people and so on. They may or may not be a big help or a big hindrance in, in your career. They're great for me in my life. The 11th is also legislative. The 11th house is, is law uh, in contrast, law in, in terms of a, a governmental legal sense, in contrast with religious laws or traditional laws or laws about customs and so on. You find this in the, in, so in, in the United States horoscope, the 11th house is the Congress because it's the sort of resources of the executive branch. Same in your chart. If your own authority is shown at the 10th house, 
uh, then the resources of that authority is shown, they're shown in the 11th. So that's the projection, collective projection of ourselves into the future. And the 12th house, finally, on, on one hand, it, it rules institutions because all institutions, things like hospitals, state agencies and clinics and uh, emergency and, and prisons and so on, these collective institutions are there to protect society from harm, society as a whole, as a collective. So that's one level of the 12th house. It's also the house of unrealized potentials of anything. So this is why the 12th house is associated with secret sorrow, self-undoing, all of those indications in the old textbooks, and they're all true. Because he, things like hidden enemies, 12th house, open enemies, 7th house. So all of these impulses toward, um, oh, self-betrayal, how we betray ourselves, 12th house for starters. Even things like suicidal thoughts can be linked with the 12th house, unrealized potentials. And again, the house of secrets the 12th house. So often the sign on the 12th house will show, give indications of how if you are unconscious about the sign on your 12th, then you are more likely to express that sign's negative side unconsciously and get the resulting effects in other people or in events and situations. For example, I have Sagittarius, I have Capricorn rising. So I have Sagittarius on my 12th house. So if I'm not careful or unconscious, I'm going to I'm going to come across as a know-it-all, arrogant, pretentious, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Oddly enough, I just described my father. He was a Sagittarian. So his son falls in my 12th house. And uh, he was all of those things. He was a wonderful doctor, too. But he was all those Sagittarian things. So I learned as much what not to do, but it took astrology to wake me up to it. So I don't know if those thumbnail things help at all, but that's... No, it's a great pass, and it's a great way to put a bow around the Secrets series because, obviously, we've correlated it to these houses as Pisces has moved around the chart with us. So thank you for that, Robert. I think we should bundle this whole thing, speaking of, and publish it. So I think we'll get about doing that and uh, put that on the list of things that, as soon as I get free from one more little project, we're going to start rolling some dice around here. And if you'd like to roll the dice with Robert, you can go to the show notes and there's a direct link to schedule him for a reading. And you'll also find our YouTube channel link in there and our Discord channel and anything else current going on with the podcast. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you next time on Old Soul, New Soul Astrology Podcast with Robert Glasscock. Mm -hmm.